So I'm going to talk a little bit about radiation exposure. Um, we'll kind of go back historically just to give you a little bit of background with fluoroscopy and exactly what exposure would be. And then we're going to transition into MIS and talk about what exposure is in that. And then we'll uh, transition to OARM as well as with OARM with MIS. Um, I have no disclosures. Um, I'm young in my career, so I don't really have any yet. Um, acknowledgements for this are two of my fellowship directors, Ed Benzel and Tom Ross. So traditionally, fluoroscopy has been used um, for intraoperative navigation, <clears throat> even to the point where we merge it with, uh, with CT preoperatively. And there are some technical issues with that, um, as we all have probably experienced. Limitations of fluoroscopy, as hopefully nobody's <laughs> experienced a whole lot, but we can see we really have no axial cut with this, which is ultimately the issue. And so the benefit with OARM or CT navigation is that we do achieve that. So radiation exposure concerns, obviously the patient, of course, is a concern, but let's be honest, patients aren't going to undergo or, or be in nearly as many procedures as we as spine surgeons are. So uh, initially we had a poor understanding about exposure um, concerns and risk. Um, now we have a lot more uh, data to support this. Initial immediate impacts can be alopecia, erythema on your skin. Long-term effects can be cataracts for exposure to the eyes who don't wear lead glasses, um, as well as eye cancer risk. So just some terminology background, um, RADS as far as your absorbed dose radiation for the patient, um, REMS, which is your, your Rentrin uh, equivalent in mammal or man, um, one gray is about 100 RADS. So there's a difference between exposure, absorb, absorbed dose, as well as your equivalent dose. So one of the most important things is actually absorbed dose. So per gram or per unit mass of tissue, the amount of radiation that's actually absorbed there. And that's really the, one of the most important pieces to follow. Um, we'll skip through that. So scatter is one of the most important um, things for surgeons in the operating room, especially noted with C-arm, fluoroscopy, x-rays. Um, this is really the important thing. Multiple, the, wor the biggest source of scatter radiation is actually the patient, the surgeon. So this is really important. This is actually kind of surprising to me when I saw this. So one minute of fluoro is about 150 chest x-rays. Therefore, when your five-minute alarm goes off, that's a heck of a lot of radiation. So we really need to keep that in the back of our head as we're thinking about transitioning to navigation or purchasing a system if you don't already have one. So there are multiple ways to protect yourself as a surgeon. You can think about equipment. You can think about lead glasses, lead gloves. If you have those readily available, of course, lead that we should wear. Lead should always be checked yearly um, and, uh, for its appropriateness and the appropriate uh, width of it. Time, minimizing time and exposure radiation, as well as the surgeon's distance. Think about having lead shields in the OR. That's also very important. Um, or if you're able to and your institution allows you to step out if you're using ORM navigation, that's also very important. So spine surgeons are at higher risk because the actual surface area, the, the girth of the area that you're radiating, is directly proportional to the amount of radiation exposure and scatter. So for us, the spine surgeons, we image the thoracic region, the abdominal area, as opposed to an orthopedic surgeon doing an extremity surgery. And so our radiation exposure for scatter is going to be significantly more. So now we're going to look at sort of an MIS comparison. This is a study done by Tom Ross at the Cleveland Clinic. Um, so, and I believe Dr. Lieberman, you are also involved in this. So this is 10 MIS uh, microdiscectomies versus 10 open. And here's the graph showing exposure of the surgeon's hand and, of course, the MIS area here significantly more than obviously an open procedure. Um, nonetheless, in spite of the fact that an MIS microdisc was, the surgeon was exposed to t 10 to 20 times the amount of radiation as opposed to an open microdisc, nonetheless, MIS still was safe. You would have to do about 9,000 MIS microdisc a year to actually achieve over the OEL. So then looking at MIS T-lifts and exposure, very similar scenario. Maximum surgeon dose under a lead gown, about 62 millirems. However, this is still less than what's concerning for your exposure throughout a year. So then we're going to look at CT assisted. This is a study by Dr. Vaccaro. CT assisted, this was using ISOC. Um, and so you wanted to look at exposure and cadavers. So basically 48 uh, lumbar screws placed in four cadavers using fluoroscopy versus the ISOC. And so he found that in fluoro, you had significantly more exposure to the radiation as opposed to if you used ISOC. This study is now transitioning to OARM navigation um, uh, TLIF. 
uh, using MIS. And so this is a study done um, actually in France um, for our French people that are here. So there's 12 patients, for MI, all for MIS TLIF, six patients in the fluoro group, six patients in the O-arm group. And of course, um, what they did is they basically used passive dosimeters at, um, at the hand for like a ring, and as well as at the eyes, and then they used the active dosimeter at the thorax. And they found that the average time of fluoroscopy was about almost four minutes um, in the fluoro group, which is quite significant, and so therefore exposure to the surgeon was a lot more. But in group two, which is the O-arm group, exposure dose, because they could step out of the room, was zero. This is a study um, done at the Cleveland Clinic. Tom Roz um, directed this. It was 10 lumbar OR cases, the dose to the surgeon, because the surgeons were able to step out of the room about, on average about four and a half meters away. Dose to the surgeon, about 44 micrograms. Very, very low. And basically, this is indicating, you know, arms completely safe for the surgeon to, to persistently do this. This is a very interesting study, um, actually done at UC Davis um, by Kleinberg, where they used 25 sheets of PMMA um, stacked on an OR table, and I actually can show you the setup here, if you can see. So here's the PMMA, and they had dosimeters here to evaluate an AP and then a lateral shot with C-arm, portable X-ray, and O-arm. And what they wanted to determine was actually bring in portable X-ray in this to see if that made a difference. Um, and here's the actual OR setup. They evaluated everybody's exposure, the anesthesiologist, the surgeon, the assistant, and the radiology technician. So patient exposure, <clears throat> as expected, with an O-arm scan, you know, significantly more. But keep in mind, this is one spot of port portable X-ray. So you can imagine if we take multiple shots in a case, this is a significant exposure to the patient versus if we do one O-arm spin. And again, similar thing here, you can see, um, if you're looking at the staff behind lead shield, and obviously nobody's going to stand in front of their lead shield, so I don't know why they measured that, but anyway. So looking here, this, this particular chart compares your x-ray versus O-arm, and you can see here, you know, you, not always when you take your port, you're going to be behind it for portable x-ray, but for C-arm, pretty much that's why you have the C-arm in there. You're going to be working and exposed to this while you're operating. So let's sort of take a second to look at the evolution of image guidance. So looking at this, we can see there's initially frame-based stereotaxy, then we brought in computer technology, frameless stereotaxy, and now we're looking at the spinal applications with O-arm. So the whole goal of using O-arm is to basically minimize your exposure to fluoro, improve your accuracy, which we actually just discussed, reduce surgical time, expense, and morbidity, but all of this does have a learning curve. So the applications that we really can utilize is for tumor, revisions, deformity, decompressions. Um, here's sort of a, just a picture of the O-arm. Um, the whole goal of this is to be exposed to a low radiation dose, but of course this is expensive. So not every institution has one. I know at Cedars we're discussing the possibility, and we're all asking for it, of getting a second one. But it's a big investment, and you have to make sure that your case volume supports that. I do want to talk about this study briefly out of the Mayo Clinic. This was looking at, with your O-arm, you have different settings. You can use an HD setting, you can use your standard setting, or you can use a pediatric or a low-dose setting. So this particular study out of the Mayo Clinic I really enjoy because this shows the numbers here. And so the question is, is your pediatric dosing adequate in a patient to be able to get good enough imaging? So, you know, very frequently we have a large patient, we just jump to that HD. I know I've done it. So um, what we should look at is actually, can we do that? So here is a quality of the pediatric <coughs> protocol that they had in their, in their patients, and then versus the standard protocol. And the, the exposure difference was significant. It was about five-fold um, larger in the standard protocol. The limitations of pediatric, basically larger patients. So if you have a patient that's greater than 100 kilos, you're probably going to have to use at least standard, if not HD. Another issue is a cervical thoracic junction. Also, patients who have either stainless steel hardware in or other hardware in, it can sometimes create artifact. So conclusions for this, basically image-guided surgery, I don't think that we're at the end of it. I think we're at just at the beginning with O-arm technology. Um, the key thing is preoperative planning, know who to do this in, what settings to, you can use to minimize your exposure as well as the patient's. Other really important thing, everything, as we've discussed, is, uh, is fallible, including technology. Um, so you need to know your surgical anatomy. That's first and foremost, because one of my worries is that we use it so much, because we're all trying to get better, that our residents and people training are actually losing the normal anatomy. Any questions? <laughs>